So we continue on back to Washington and obviously, you know, as we're on the flight, it then starts to occur to me once we're kind of relaxed and, and you know, outside the chaos of the moment that, wow, the President of the United States has basically de decapitated the FBI leadership, has removed the person investigating his campaign. And at that time, and as I write in the book, um, which I hope you'll, you know, you, you'll enjoy these parts, at least find them enlightening, is at that time, there were only a handful of us that knew about the loyalty pledge, uh, that knew about the demand to drop the Flynn investigation. And so that would later shock the country, uh, and then that would lead to Mueller and, and that investigation. Thank you all for coming tonight. Josh is going to begin with a reading, and then we'll get into a conversation, a short reading. So Josh, welcome. It seems that the FBI is in the news uh, every single day uh, as it relates to the White House, as it relates to uh, a lot of the major national security issues. I'll start with a reading from chapter two. Judging by his past performances, the FBI director was gearing up to execute a covert campaign of total manipulation. His arrival in New York that fall day would shake the newly elected president to his core. The director had controlled many politicians in his lifetime, and this time would be no different. Although the President of the United States was widely regarded as the most powerful person in the world, the head of the nation's mighty federal law enforcement agency wielded unusual influence over those who technically held the levers of power. As he sat across from the President-elect at a hotel on the edge of Midtown Manhattan, the Director's goal was to win over the new Chief Executive by letting him in on some secrets. Doing so would not only serve to ingratiate him with his new boss, but would also help shape their power dynamic by subtly signaling that the FBI could either be his friend or his foe. This had been the MO for many years, doling out tidbits of information that would impress the listener while also demonstrating the FBI's seeming omniscience. When you get into the White House, the director said, don't make any calls through the switchboard. The telephone lines were monitored. Little men you don't know will be listening. The director then dropped another bombshell. The FBI had bugged the cabin of the president-elect's campaign plane at the direction of the outgoing commander-in-chief. The stunning claim rattled the characteristically paranoid politician. He would later fume that everything he had discussed on his flights was now in the possession of his political enemies. As the new president's chief of staff would later describe it, the FBI director's tactics in sharing sensitive information served to create an impression of how powerful and useful the bureau could be to the president. For his part, the new president was all too willing to forge this alliance. The FBI's power was something he might be able to exploit for personal gain. You are one of the few people who is to have direct access to me at all times, the president told the FBI director. And as J. Edgar Hoover stood and left the hotel that day in 1968, President-elect Richard Nixon turned to an aide and said, we'll get that bugging crap out of the White House in a hurry. Throughout, it's a terrific read, not just about um, the events of our time, which we'll clearly want to get into today, uh, but also a larger story about institutions that uh, exist to protect and defend the United States and the political pressures they come over, they come under. Uh, but I'm going to begin with a, just a, get, you getting to know Josh, because it is also a story about his life. So first of all, just the, the title of the book. Uh, many people may be familiar with it, but tell us how you came to the title. So this title, Crossfire Hurricane, some might remember from the Rolling Stones song. Uh, this was the title, the code name of the FBI's investigation into members of the Trump campaign and their associations with Russia. Now, I'd spent about 13 years inside the FBI working investigations, and oftentimes uh, you would have code names associated with your investigation, and it served a number of reasons. The first, brevity, right? You want to be able to reference what your case is but also operational security. These cases are often highly restricted to a small number of people, especially when you're talking about something involving a politician or someone especially seeking the highest office in the land. And so, for example, if you pass someone in the hall and you ask them, where are you going? Rather than saying, 
I'm going to this meeting to determine whether people associated with Donald Trump are in bed <laughs> with the Russians, you can just say, I'm going to this crossfire hurricane meeting. Um, it's interesting because agents can actually set their own code name for their investigations if they want. There is this mythical computer database that inside the FBI that will spit out <laughs> random words if you're not creative enough to come up with your own. I say mythical because I guarantee you, if you talk to anyone inside the FBI, everybody has heard of this program, but no one, <laughs> but no one has ever used it. <laughs> and so uh, the book opens, it is about, of course, the investigation of uh, Donald Trump and also the reaction of the FBI to a really unprecedented um, uh, investigation. And um, the book opens with a really powerful scene. It's the scene where former FBI Director Comey has been essentially tasked by everyone else to tell the president um, about the allegations in the Steele dossier, essentially that there are very strong allegations related to a, a variety of different kinds of conduct. Ironically, and we'll get into it, Comey is chosen because he is seen as safe from being fired because of the tradition of not firing an FBI director. So the book opens with this scene and you're in the room, you're with Comey as he's gearing up, we'll get into that. So how did you end up in that room? Like what, what is that story of you and Comey? So my career in the FBI had started back uh, in college, I was an intern and then got hired on directly after that and served in a number of different assignments. Uh, after going to the academy, I'd worked counterterrorism investigations. Domestically, I was on one of the FBI's uh, few teams that covered international investigations, and so I spent a fair amount of time overseas working with folks at CIA and the Defense Department. Um, and then as I progressed in my career, you have to do your headquarters time, so you come back to Washington. Um, and it was actually this chance encounter where I was finishing my uh, headquarters time. I was getting ready to go back to the field, and I had this encounter with Comey at this event, uh, where I found myself in, essentially in a room alone with him as he was waiting to go out and do this event. And he started asking me questions about my story um, and you know, my past and, and how I got to be where I was. And then he said, so how am I doing? And I thought, well, in general, like today or, you know, <laughs> he said, no, he said, you were in the field, you were, you know, different roles. He said, how am I doing as the FBI director? And it went by in a flash, but you know, there are moments where you stop and you, you try to process. And I, I literally thought, okay, I'm leaving headquarters. I'm going back to the field. If I say something critical, I mean, what are they gonna do to me, right? I'm leaving, right? Uh, and I also thought, this is the CEO of this organization. So when am I gonna have this opportunity? Because like all of us, if there's an organization that you love and care about, there are things that you probably wanna change. And so I told him, I said, you know, I think you're doing a good job. I said, but there are a lot of things that, you know, we could fix. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you've, you've made a lot of promises as the FBI director, but if you don't make good on them, then that's worse than promising anything at all, especially in this very suspicious institution. And he pressed me, and so we had a, you know, um, very aggressive conversation at times. <laughs> uh, but I left the room thinking, okay, wow, that's great. I got to talk to the boss and, you know, explain to him at least my view. And so the next week, as I was getting ready to head back to the field, back to Los Angeles, and move from D.C. back to L.A., I get a call from his office, and uh, long story short, he hired me as his special <laughs> assistant. Um, and the, our first meeting, he said, I want you to help me fix all that stuff that you said was messed up. And so that was my introduction to Jim Comey, and we can get into him as a person, but that really set the dynamic. He wanted to be surrounded by people who would, who would give it to him straight. You know, this, this is what's wrong, and this is what we need to fix. And so fast forward, as part of that responsibility, I would staff him uh, as he traveled the country and, and the world as FBI director, and this one meeting in particular where he is set to travel with the heads of the national intelligence agencies to Trump Tower, which is fascinating because the reading that I gave earlier, just, just a few minutes ago, it, the, the dynamic is striking because this was three blocks away from huh. where J. Edgar Hoover had briefed Nixon. And the dynamic couldn't have been more different between the two because we know J. Edgar Hoover, and you know, obviously this is my assessment, was trying to manipulate Nixon, as he had done in the past with politicians, whereas Comey, his goal there was to essentially give the president a heads up on this material that was circulating in Washington, wanting him to know what the government had. And as I contend and as I write in the book, I think that meeting was the beginning of the end of his career. Yeah. And, and okay, so he, he walks in, so now let's, let's uh, set the stage for 
2016, um, and then of course later on these sort of attacks on the FBI. When did you, as part of Comey's team, become aware of, of the, um, you can fill in the verb, you know, collusion, cooperation, whatever it is, but of the top, what Russia was doing in the election and the Trump families uh, and, and, and the campaign's willingness, fill in the verb, desire, whatever you want, uh, to, um, to work with the Russians in this regard. How far back was that happening? Well, it, it, it's an important question, and, and the, I think the reason why it's, it's important to answer uh, with a bit of you know, chronology is yeah. because, as I contend again in this book, that this campaign of attack that we've seen against the FBI has tried to blur the lines between all of this as though somehow inside the FBI, investigators woke up one day and said, we're gonna go after Donald Trump and his people because we don't want him to become president. Which, uh, you know, again, people inside the FBI think, really? Like, you, you think that, that that's their view? I mean, this independent institution. Now, we'll get into the mistakes the FBI made because they don't get a pass in this book. Um, I don't have to tell an audience in Boston that the FBI's history is not pure. And it's an agency that has to be constantly overseen. Right. The, the power is immense, and you know, with that responsibility also comes come the checks and balances. Uh, but this idea that they were politically motivated to bring down Trump, I think, is a house of cards, uh, and we can get into the reasons why. But at the time, inside the FBI, the counterintelligence investigators stared at two sets of facts. The first being that the Russians were interfering with the election stealing information from the Democratic National Committee, hacking into their systems, hacking into Hillary Clinton, uh, her staff, stealing their information and weaponizing it. And essentially, as you know, we all know, pushing information to WikiLeaks and getting that out in order to change public opinion in the United States. So there's that part, which the FBI was fully involved in investigating. Along the lines, the FBI gets word that there's a Trump campaign staffer who had bragged to one of our uh, foreign partners about the Russians having dirt on Hillary Clinton. And so if you're investigating the Russians attacking our election and you get intelligence saying that the Trump campaign might know about it, that's an interesting data point. <laughs> and then you look at people in Trump's orbit and what the FBI had assessed is it wasn't just one person, but there were three others. So a total of four people who all in some way had some suspicious ties to the Russians. And so as I contend, if you stare at those facts and you're the FBI and you don't investigate that, you're, you're derelict in your duty. Uh, and so that set the stage for this investigation. Um, obviously, we're on the cusp right now. And, and you know, Julie and I are, are obviously colleagues at CNN. We cover this on a, on a daily basis. We're on the cusp of this inspector general report inside the FBI that's actually looking into the FBI's opening of this investigation to ensure that they did everything that they did uh, correctly. And I can tell you, having you know, lived through many investigations, the IG is not there to hand out gold stars. Right. Um, they always tend to find something, but I think what we'll wait to see is whether this was you know, a, a policy or procedural you know, issue that they may find, which obviously has to be corrected, uh, or whether, as the president has said, and I think the majority leader in the Republican, uh, the re majority leader, the minority leader in the House of Representatives said that he expects Comey will be indicted. Um, I talked to Jim Comey two days ago, um, and he said that that would be news to him <laughs> if he is indicted. Uh, but that's where we are. You know, again, this blurring of the line of what actually started that investigation, where if you break it down into its individual parts, this is what the FBI does on any, any given day. And so when, when Comey, this is the, a pivotal point in the book, when Comey goes in and essentially does seal his fate with uh, Donald Trump, um, what was Donald Trump's reaction to, in particular, the sexual allegations in the Steele dossier, what was his reaction that sort of set the stage for what's about to happen in the, in the months to come? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, again, put yourself in Comey's shoes. He feels he, ha he wants to tell the president something before the president reads about it in the Washington Post. Um, and that included this, you know, this, these tawdry details about his personal life that the Russians allegedly had uh, collected. And it was uncorroborated. And he told the president that, that, you know, we don't necessarily credit this information, yeah. but we want you to know that it's out there. Uh, and the president became very defensive. Um, and, and I think one of the quotes was, you know, I'm not the kind of person who needs prostitutes, um, which Comey said that that's just a surreal, you know, 
hearing answer. from a yeah, president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so that, that's that's the reaction. And one other thing was really striking to not only Comey but the other intelligence chiefs that were briefing uh, the larger Trump team, not not about the dossier, but in this uh, the second meeting. Uh, their goal was to explain what the intelligence community had assessed as it related to the cyber warfare of the Russians. And one thing that they said was striking after the meeting is that the response from Team Trump wasn't how do we lock this down and ensure that our election is secure? The response from them was, is this going to delegitimize us in our election? Where that shocked each of these uh, you know, heads uh, almost to a person. Um, and so that set the stage. And what, what was interesting is that later President Trump would say that he saw that meeting as Comey pulling a J. Edgar Hoover mm. and lording over him salacious information as though we just want you to know that the FBI has this information on you, which again, and I say this, you know, obviously coming from now a journalistic standpoint, there are two sides to this. Yeah. The president says that none of what Comey, you know, has said about their interactions is true. Um, the Washington Post has also said that I think he's lied some 12,000 times, so you can make up your mind. Uh, but Comey says that, you know, these things occurred. And so as you look at these two individuals, they couldn't have been more different from the beginning. And as I, as I write, this clash set the stage for what I think was an ine inevitable firing to come. But it was different. I mean, it was inevitable firing, the, the clash of these two personalities. And we're going to get into Comey and what's going on as well and, mm -hmm. and, um, and your assessment of sort of his conduct and stuff. But what's different here is that, um, and sort of want to get your sense of how, how the FBI braced for this, was from the beginning, the attacks on the FBI, the CIA, and other law enforcement intelligence agencies in a way that w is harmful to those institutions' sense of what their mission is, right? So, so when he begins to attack the FBI for the investigation itself, one, it's bad for the FBI. Two, it's undermining what's a clear overlay of your book, which is the Russians could very well have something on the president of the United States, which is driving a lot of this behavior. No, it, it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating when you look at the actions, um, the, the president's response to each step along the, the Mueller investigation, for yeah. example, which, you know, when I talk about the attack on the FBI, this is this, this larger group. The investigation started with the FBI and then obviously went to Robert Mueller, which uh, his team consisted of FBI agents and prosecutors, right. along with the 14, 15, 18 angry Democrats, however many of the number kept you know, going up. <laughs> um, but you know, these were investigators who were trying to do a job. And what I contend in the book is that the campaign of attack against the FBI uh, is something we see in politics a lot, right? You have two sides that fight with each other. You think of any you know, contentious election where you have two sides trying to either discredit each other or you know, appeal to the public opinion, to set a narrative that I'm better than this person and sometimes that involves destroying that person, right. their credibility. Fair game in politics, right? It's been around since, since the, the start of the founding of our country. The problem is, is that when one of those parties is a federal law enforcement agency and politics is now thrust onto them and they are now one of these parties that's being undermined, it's not just, okay, at the end of the election, on election day, some party, they can lick their wounds and then come back. These agencies have to have credibility in order to keep us safe. And as I described, you know, when an FBI agent knocks on someone's door and they need assistance, or you know, they're trying to recruit an informant to break down some terrorist cell or you know, to, to disrupt some spy network, the willingness of those people to help the government is directly correlated to what they think of this FBI agent. Is this an institution that's credible or are they a bunch of crooks? Um, and you know, I could go on and on, but you know, think about juries and judges. I mean, these are yeah. people who walk in with an opinion formulated about these agencies, largely that they hear from the media and you know, uh, you know, their elected leaders. And so, this isn't just my opinion as someone who was on the receiving end of these attacks in, in this institution early on. But you look at polling data now, and uh, what really fascinated me was this, the subset of Republicans uh, that Gallup polled yeah. as far as confidence in the FBI. So in 2014, it was somewhere in the high 70s of, among Republicans had high confidence in the FBI. Today, that's just under 50%, which says that this narrative is taking hold, that people are believing that these agencies are corrupt and they're crooked, uh, which, as I say, have long-term consequences on public safety. When these attacks begin, Comey is still the FBI director. Uh, 
and it's sort of reaching a crescendo. You're in Los Angeles when it reaches that crescendo, mm -hmm. just to, because I think that was such a, um, I think for a lot of us, that was a moment where everything you thought Donald Trump wouldn't do, he had the intention of doing, was for mm -hmm. me, the firing of Comey. I, 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 was, I switched, yeah. you know, I just thought. And so tell us about sort of that news and you working for Comey, and then what did you do? And then I want you to answer this question, which is, what did you think mm -hmm. about why Donald Trump did that? No, it's, it's, it's interesting because you, you look at the months preceding. So as we now know, the public now knows, so the president uh, in a one-on-one -on -one dinner with the FBI director, according to Jim Comey, had demanded loyalty of the FBI director, which is something that you know, I don't think we've seen, at least certainly not in modern history. Um, and Comey said he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it, which if you're the president, then obviously that's going to grade on you you're demanding loyalty from someone. And we know that you know, Donald Trump, he uses that, that word himself, they're, they're, this person is disloyal. And so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that maybe Comey was telling the truth about what happened in that, in that dinner. Uh, so there's that. Secondly, and this is again, just unprecedented, as Comey had des has described, later on in a one-on-one -on -one meeting in the Oval Office, the president had asked the FBI director to drop an investigation into Michael Flynn, the national security advisor, which again, removed the names Trump, Comey, Flynn, any of these people. The allegation is, is that the president asked the nation's chief law enforcement officer to drop an investigation into one of his associates, which is stunning. And obviously Comey said he wouldn't do that. The third prong, the, 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 the kicker I think for, for Donald Trump was he on numerous occasions had asked Comey to publicly announce that he himself was not under investigation. And Comey said he wouldn't do it, and his rationale, as he described for me at the time, and then as he's later said publicly, is he didn't want to set the stage for a duty to correct the record, because if Donald Trump became you know, under investigation, he would then feel the need to come out and publicly say so. We saw how that worked out with the Hillary yeah. Clinton case, where yeah. he thought he had to correct the record. Um, people obviously, are, uh, lots of critics for, for that decision to this day. Um, so this leads to this day where we're in Los Angeles. He's doing just a typical field office visit. Uh, he's meeting the troops. He's walking around uh, the floors and just talking with people. And he stops into the 14th floor operations center at the FBI office in Los Angeles. He's addressing a group of employees about this size. And at this time on his staff, I had perfected the art of standing kind of off stage, listening with one ear, kind of half listening, and then on my phone preparing for the next thing that we're going to do. And there's silence and it kind of snaps me out of my reading and I look over and he's looking at me and he's nodding to the back of the room and I look and there are two televisions, one of them's tuned, turn, uh, tuned to Fox News and on the banner it says Comey resigns and he was obviously, you know, he didn't know what to make of that because presumably he would know if he resigned huh. uh, and so he thought that maybe there, there was some tech agent uh, yeah. that was pulling a joke on him that they had, you know, crafted oh, something. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but then CNN, the TV next to it, within a matter of seconds, our colleague Jeff Salony was mm. standing in the White House lawn and says, no, in fact, the FBI director has been fired by the president. And in that moment, there were gasps in the room yeah. and he didn't know what to make of it. And so I step off. He continues to address, you know, you know what do you do? You don't rush off the stage. But, um, and so I call our, uh, the leadership in Washington and they had no idea what had happened. Right. And so I'm informing them of what was happening, and then they're seeing it, you know, in real-time reflections on their television. Uh, and as it turns out, the president had had his personal bodyguard go to the FBI headquarters, the Hoover Building, of all, all the names, um, and dropped off a letter at the visitor center uh, removing Comey from the position of FBI director. And so he learned that he had been fired, not from a phone call, not from a quote from the president saying, you're fired, but from CNN. Uh, and then you can read the full kind of story in the book, yeah. but it's chaos after that. And, but to your question about what I was thinking at the time, honestly, in, in the immediate moment, you know, I'd like to say that I suddenly thought philosophical about the importance of institutions and independence, but now the only thing I was thinking is like, we need to get back to Washington. And so I kind of walked through just the, the, the nonsense of that day where, you know, people were questioning inside DOJ whether Comey would actually be allowed to fly back on the government airplane. Uh, and it just smacked of this, you know, this uh, retribution. And so at one point, I, um, 
we'll keep this in the room. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I turned off my phone and just threw it in my bag. Just like, okay, um, plausible deniability. Like if they call to say, you're not flying, right. then at least, you know, man, I never knew I was busy. Um, so we continue on back to Washington. And obviously, you know, as we're on the flight, it then starts to occur to me once we're kind of relaxed and, and you know, outside the chaos of the moment that, wow, the president of the United States has basically de decapitated the FBI leadership, right. has removed the person investigating his campaign. And at that time, and as I write in the book, um, which I hope you'll, you know, you'll enjoy these parts, at least find them enlightening, is at that time, there were only a handful of us that knew about the loyalty pledge, uh, that knew about the yeah. demand to drop the Flynn investigation. And so that would later shock the country, uh, and then that would lead to Mueller and, and that investigation. So I want to, um, one more question about Trump, and then I want to turn to Comey. Um, finish this sentence for me. Trump is blank by the Russians. Hmm. Compromised, colluded. What, what, is that, what is that word? Because something, as you described, something's not right. And I think we've all been struggling for that word, or a lot of people have their word. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if I know that word, but the way I explain it is, and again, looking at this even just journalistically, right? Trying to look at the facts. I think we're running out of innocent explanations for what's going on. And, you know, I don't know if I'm there to say exactly what that is, but, you know, I think we're all probably intelligent people, you know, in this room that can look at something and say, okay, his foreign policy actions are often counter to the foreign policy yeah. interests of the United States. He has sided with the Russians on multiple occasions over the, his own U.S. intelligence community. And so you see that time and time again, it's just hard to figure out how these actions benefit the United States. And as a former you know, investigator, we were both in the security business, you start looking at motivation and assessing what is driving behavior. And as I mentioned, I think we were running out of, of innocent explanations for that. Um, okay, so I wanna to turn to Comey, your mm -hmm. boss, who's also a complicated, loved, unloved figure for many people. If you were writing Comey's biography, what's his best attribute and what was his greatest flaw? Hmm. I think his, his best attribute, um, I, I would say his attributes were his leadership qualities. Um, as I mentioned, the reason I was hired is because he wanted people around him that would you know, uh, disagree with him, I guess. Um, and he would think about leadership all the time. In fact, you know, this is interesting. I don't, I don't I haven't talked about this at length, but inside his office was this giant whiteboard and he had actually had the team print out these little two inch by two inch headshots, the pictures of all the senior leaders in the FBI, the senior executive service. So it's like some two, 200 people. And he would constantly stare at this because he thought he had a 10 year term, little did he know. Right. And so he's thinking for the rest of his term, who are the people that have these qualities, this servant leadership, not the bullies. He, he tried to rid the organization of these bullies who just, you know, um, basically they, they led by fear. And he, he actually had this map out that this person at two and four years is probably going to be here and then they're going to lead a field office because, again, he wanted those leadership qualities in this organization. That, those were the best qualities, you know, without fault, uh, without question. Um, he also, and this was interesting, and I, I, I provide one example in the book where he, he, he loathed bullies to his core. Uh, and I tell the story, we were, we were in, uh, well, I won't say the city, that'll give it away, but uh, we were in a particular, uh, particular city and we're meeting with a um, uh, high profile uh, government person. And the person I could tell is just grating on him because he's in this meeting with people and this person is just interrupting and you know, uh, you can, you, the ego is just you know, filling the room. And every time this person talks and interrupts someone else, Comey looks over at me and just shoots me this look of yeah. just disgust. And so, you know, we've seen that, before. I've seen, I'd seen that before, but as we get ready to leave, this person comes up and says, director, you're going back to Washington. I'm going back to Washington. I'm just gonna fly with you. Wasn't a question. And so I <laughs> kind of choked like, wow, that was pretty, you know. Bold. Yeah, bold. Yeah. Um, and Comey's looking and he's, you know, shaking his head and so, and I say, oh, you know, there are different policies and procedures and protocols for flying on the government jet. It's, you know, I'm trying to be like the diplomat. And, uh, and so we get back to the plane. We walk in, you know, inside this, the Gulf Stream, the FBI's Gulf Stream, where there are some 12 empty chairs and we take off our, our coats and throw them on. And he says, can you believe that guy? Like, where does that ego come from? 
And he says, by the way, if that guy were here, where would we put our coats? <laughs> uh, but but, but he, he, it was that servant leadership that he wanted in people. So I can you know, go on and on. The faults, the, the, the mistakes, obviously he's going to be long remembered for his decisions in the Hillary Clinton investigation. Uh, and one thing I fault him for, which I do in the book, you know, I, I, I've told him as much as well, um, one criticism I have in particular is the language that he used to, uh, mm -hmm. to criticize Hillary Clinton and her behavior. Uh, at the same time, he was saying, I'm not recommending prosecution. It's either one or the other, right? You, in my opinion. Yeah. And, so, and it's funny because in, this, in one of the chapters, I actually sat down with Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign manager later on because I was really interested about this dynamic. Here I was, the assistant to the person leading the investigation. Here he was, the assistant to the candidate, the subject of the investigation. And I wanted to get his view. Um, and one thing that he said, you know, he said, we, we were reeling because he just basically said, she didn't do anything wrong that we're gonna prosecute, but she's a terrible person. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, so what do you do with that information? So I criticized him for that. One other, and I'll, and I'll, I'll just briefly, uh, because I think it's important to, to talk about the faults, not just you know, the, the good things, but the way in which he handled his memos, I criticized him for mm -hmm. that. Leaking that to the New York Times, rather than putting his name on it or going through the process you know, with Congress or the right. courts to ensure that the public had that information. Now, as someone in journalism, I love when people leak me memos, so, you know, provide me memos, but uh, at the time, you know, in government, you don't want people doing that, especially at that high profile power, and I, uh, that position, and as I've said, I think it hurt him more than it helped him. Yeah. Yes, it did, that was the start of the, the Mueller investigation. It worked. What he set out to do was to prompt a special counsel, which worked. But in the end, I think it was, it was you know, it, he took a hit to his own credibility. I want to ask about that Hillary decision. I think what's inexplicable um, is the knowledge that you had, Crossfire, Operation Crossfire Hurricane, mm -hmm. ongoing, but the disclosure by Comey, it could be that it is inexplicable. You don't have to put the piece, but did it make sense to you that the American public knew about one and which was arguably, you know, was about emails and the, did not know about the other, which was about Russian influence on the campaign? No, it's, it's a great question. And you know, the way, the way I look at this and the way, and the way leadership has explained it is the investigations were on different timelines. And so it's, it's hard to, you know, the whole apples and oranges thing, right? So, you know, the Clinton investigation was closed when he announced right. that she was, you know, not going to be prosecuted. Whereas the Russia investigation had started in July of 2016. And so, you know, just a few months before the actual election. And so it's in its infancy. And at that time, the FBI didn't really know the full picture of what they had. And, you know, and I asked Comey, I interviewed him for the book, you know, why would you announce the Hillary's, you know, case and not talk about uh, the Russia case, and he said, well, what would I have said? That we've opened this investigation, we don't really know what's there, we don't really know if it implicates the candidate, there's a lot we don't know, and by the way, it's classified and you're not gonna hear anything else from us. You know, what would that do right. to the American people? You'd have more questions than answers. Um, the one thing I do think that that does help uh, destroy is this notion of a deep state which I talk a lot about in the book. And the president, he's, he's obviously yeah. still talking about that. The witch hunt, the people that are out to get him. I am highly confident that through the 2020 election, he is going to run on the FBI and the Justice Department, quote unquote, robbing him of his, the first three years of his presidency. But the question you ask is so important because to me, if, if you don't believe me telling you that there's mm -hmm. not a deep state, because you know maybe I'm in on it, <laughs> I'm trying to convince you, <laughs> then ask yourself this question. It's late 2016, the FBI, we have the investigation into the Trump campaign underway, but no one leaked it. Yeah, no one said a word. That would have been a death knell to his campaign. Lights out. What, a, four people in your campaign have ties to the Russians? You, you know, you were, your son and your son-in-law were setting up a meeting to take dirt from the Russians? If that had been leaked, that would have been it, lights out. But obviously it didn't leak. Because as I contend, you had public servants doing their job in secret who thought that it was you know, important to do the normal right thing with these mm -hmm. investigations that has to do them confidentially until you know what you have. And so in my mind, this destroys that notion of a deep state because there's a Washington Post a journalist, Aaron Blake, who wrote, and I, mm -hmm. I quoted him in the book because he, he described that even more succinct, succinctly than me. He said, so what the president would have you believe is that there was this conspiracy to prevent the president from seeking office 
but they waited until after he got elected to do anything about it. Like that is a poorly, con you know, <laughs> poor conspiracy. Yeah. Um, That's right. But it's important to have these yeah. obviously academic discussions. But by the way, none of what I just said fits in a tweet and 280 characters, and so it requires discussion to actually talk yeah. about, which we don't seem to have that kind of time, you know, in this modern era. Um, I want to ask one more question, and uh, we're running out of time, so this is fascinating. So just to uh, prep people for Q and A, um, which is a simple question, which is why did you write the book? Hmm. I I wrote the book for, for two reasons. The first being to give voice to the voiceless. We've heard a lot from people on the right, on the left, from during the Clinton case, during the Russia case, during the Mueller investigation. Uh, We've heard a lot from the president criticizing these institutions. What we haven't heard of the rank and file and, and their view. And so what I did, you know, I interviewed dozens of people for this book because I didn't want this just to be my own story, uh, but I wanted to get a, you know, a snapshot, a, you know, a reflection. And it's, I think it's important because you have to put yourself in the shoes of these people who go to work every single day working to protect this country. And yet throughout this you know, last two, three years, their CEO, has come to work every day calling them crooks and calling them criminals. And that impacts them, it impacts morale, it's impacted recruiting. And so I wanna tell that story because I think it's important that, you know, that they have a, a voice in some sense. But then the second thing, and this is even more important than how they feel on any given day, is what I talked about with public safety. That if this campaign continues, if the public loses confidence in law enforcement and in the FBI, if the president is successful in having all of us believe that the modern intelligence community is the same as the J. Edgar Hoover 1970s era yeah. FBI and intelligence community, then we are going to be less safe. And even worse, I got no good news, um, it may take a generation to get that confidence back because you think about how much time has passed since the 1970s after these reforms uh, that were put in place and the constraints on the intelligence community. I fear the long term. And the last thing, you know, as I mentioned, in 2020, this is going to be the campaign platform. So I wrote the book as this call to action for, for good people that, you know, you may disagree with the FBI. You, you know, I'm, I'm uh, in a civil liber libertarian in the sense that I think that there should be great oversight over these agencies. I was an FBI agent, and I think oversight is a great thing. Yeah. Um, you can't say, trust us, you know, we'll do the right thing. You have to have someone checking your work. Uh, but you also need the American people and those who you know, care about the rule of law to stand up and say that these political attacks are dangerous. And that's what I, help, I try to do is tell that story. Wonderful, Josh, thank you so much. We're not done yet, but I, um, I wanna uh, give the opportunity to the audience to ask questions of Josh for the next 15 um, or so minutes. Uh, and please introduce yourself and in the form of a question. Um, the couple of the facts wrong there, so it wasn't, it's not Comey that was faulted for lying. It was, it was Andrew McCabe. Um, so, so that's just a quick point. And it wasn't McCabe at Trump Tower, it was Comey. But that said, you are right in the sense that uh, you know, I've heard this narrative that, that Comey was there as part of this meeting to collect information. Um, and if that's the case, I guess I would say, okay, that's also part of the investigative process. If you're trying to determine whether or not the president knows about what his associates are doing as it relates to Russia, you're gonna document that. You mentioned he got in the limousine and started writing, typing away. You're absolutely right, I handed him the laptop um, to start making those no notes because he wanted to capture that moment. Uh, one thing that you say, which is, which is so important, and again, especially someone in the FBI who was in the FBI, there's a, there's a danger that, okay, you're a defender of the FBI, which I'm not a defender of their actions. I'm, defender, I'm a defender of them being able to do their job without political attacks. And so what we'll have to wait and see, which is, we're, it could come any day now, is this inspector general report that's going to go back and look at their work. And I'm reserving judgment on that. You can reserve judgment if you want, or, or you know, or, or, or formulate an opinion now, um, the thing that you just said is true. There may be more to come out of that, and we'll just have to wait and see. Again, the Inspector General may come out and say that the way this was kicked off, was started, was faulty, and he'll mm -hmm. lay out you know, a number of reasons, which obviously we need to hear about that. But he may also say, and this is why it's important to reserve judgment, is you had people that were doing their job to protect this country from counterintelligence threats and a foreign adversary. And I think we should keep an open mind until we see those results. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi. I'm Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for speaking the truth. Thank you. Uh, I'm only into about chapter four, and I have to tell you, reading chapter three, but her emails, I almost started retching. 
reading that, it was so painful. Mm. Um, on the 28th of October, 2016, I was flying from Boston to Orlando to knock on doors for Hillary. Mm. And as soon as we landed, I checked Twitter and saw that terrible, terrible news. Uh, I don't know if you address further on in the book um, regret, mm -hmm. uh, if you deal with, did he actually break protocol? Um, so you don't have to answer that question now. Um, well, you can answer that yeah, question Yeah, no, I certainly can. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm happy I to. I think it would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so what she's talking about, on October 28th, Jim Comey sends a letter to Congress informing them that the Hillary Clinton investigation has been reopened. And Congress immediately leaks that letter to the public. And now it's known publicly that the case is reopened. And this is one of those actions where Jim Comey has to defend himself. I can explain his, what he said his rationale is. Mm -hmm. And that is, he had already told the Congress and the American people that the case was closed. And if anything came to light that would, might change that, that he would let them know. And something did come to light around that time, and that is one of Secretary Clinton's aides had backed up her emails on a computer belonging to, you know, I would think it's fair to say disgraced former Congressman Anthony Weiner. Um, and the FBI, their view was that these may have been the missing emails that they could not get as part of that investigation. So there might be evidence out there that they have to go after. And so what Comey was trying to decide is, okay, if I do something, then that's an action. If I do nothing, then that's an action. And so what he was trying to think, and again, you can, you can, I'm, I'm not defending him, I'm explaining what his thought mm -hmm. is. You can formulate your own view. His view was that if it came to light later that the FBI had reopened the investigation and kept that from the public, then that would destroy the public's confidence in the FBI uh, in a way that he thought would have been the, the, the worst of, of two bad options. Um, of course, had he not announced that, and then it panned out, and there was nothing there, then, you know, but he, but he couldn't see, see the future. Um, but I think that's, obviously, that will probably be in the first paragraph of his obituary someday, which I think he knows <laughs> yeah. his impact on that election, potentially, yeah. uh, as it related to public opinion, because by that time, so close to the election, mm -hmm. when public opinion is being formulated, the one thing I would say, is, you know, so I've laid out the case of, of, you know, the impact he had negatively. The, I guess the other case I would lay out is, you know, had those emails been provided early on in the investigation, mm -hmm. which again, you have to remember, this was Secretary Clinton's team that deleted these emails, they didn't provide them to the FBI, then there would have been no reason for the FBI to reopen the case and go after that later on. So there's no good answer. It's, but there is one other thing which I think is important, and, and again, this isn't a partisan thing. The one thing I've noticed in talking with people is, and it's hard not to do this, is to look at the current administration and to blame, you know, if you, if you think there are bad things going on in this administration, to look back and say, we wouldn't have had any of this if Jim Comey hadn't done mm. what he did, which again, that's a fair criticism. Um, but, but the unfair part, I think, is looking at it just, you know, the broad brushing and not looking at each decision and reviewing them on their own merit. Mm -hmm deciding not to prosecute her, but calling her a bad person, reopening the investigation at, you know, right before, and then sending in a letter saying, no, by the way, we closed it and we didn't find anything. I think we have to be more surgical, uh, just mm -hmm. because I think that, that's, that's a more intelligent discussion. Thank you, and does Giuliani come up anywhere with regards <laughs> he to He does that? indeed, in the book. He does, yeah. In the book, yes. Okay. Yes, stay tuned. <laughs> he, he won't like it, but yes, he's in there. <laughs> I just have one final thing. Have fun with CIA Spy Girl next week. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. Thank you so much. One of our good friends. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? No? Can I follow up uh, with two quick things yeah. then? I mean, one is um, that where were you election night? And what was your reaction knowing essentially what happened in those last two weeks? For me, I'll be honest with you, you're, I mean, I think, I think this is not an apology for Comey or whatever. I think for me, when you say deconstruct the different pieces, the one that still is just inexplicable to me is the press conference closing the case. That one seemed to me to come from a, 
real ill will mm. um, that was inappropriate for Comey. The rest of it, actually, I think from a law enforcement purpose, but the cumulative impact of mm. all those things, she's a horrible person, we have the email, she, you know, even being affiliated with Anthony Weiner, mm. you know. Um, so election night comes, uh, where are you as the, as they say, the blue wall falls, and what are you thinking about what's about to happen to the FBI? You know, it's, it's uh, so I was in D.C. at the time, you know, living there, and I actually didn't, I actually didn't make it stay up late enough. To know. Because remember, it went late, you know, late into the night, because in the run-up to an election, you know, the FBI is really busy, <laughs> and we're doing a lot of things. You have the operations center that's going. You're, you know, again, trying to ensure that uh, there isn't an attack on the critical infrastructure, right. you know, at that time. And so, uh, to be honest, I was exhausted. And the more time went, the more time went, um, you know, I fell asleep and then I wake up, you know, in the early morning hours and learn, you know, what had happened. Uh, but what was really fascinating is right after that, the day after the uh, election day, Comey was set to speak uh, at a regular gathering of intelligence community employees um, to talk about leadership and to talk about tough decisions when you're a leader. And it couldn't have come at a more awkward day. Hmm. And so we walk in the building, it's the, Na the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, they happened to host it that, that uh, year. And so we walk in and there are you know, several hundred people in the audience and Comey walks in and this room goes silent. And I'm not being overly dramatic, it, was, it went silent because everyone was looking at the, the six foot eight guy that's walking in right. and saying, this guy has impacted this election, whether you agree or not, like he has been at the forward, center stage yeah. of all of the controversial decisions. And so he gives this talk, and obviously he, you know, he didn't mention the president by name, but he just said it's been a heck of a year, obviously, for, yeah. for the FBI. But the one thing that was really interesting that really struck me is, as we were getting ready to leave, there was a guy who, who came up to him, and he was, he was angry, I, could, I, I sensed. Mm -hmm. I mean, his hands were shaking, he was wringing them, and, he, and as he walks up, he says, Mr. Director, he says, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Hmm. And I'm thinking, he's about to blast Comey, yeah. you know, and you know, the security details there, they're obviously not gonna jump on the guy, but everyone's bracing for what's about to happen. And he looks at him and he says, you are in an impossible situation, sir. Oh. He says, you are in an impossible situation. And we, and we were rendered speechless yeah. because this guy in a matter of however many seconds had just basically summarized the entire election season for the FBI and for Jim Comey. And whether you agree with him or not, and again, as I mentioned, I criticize him and his actions in this book, and you, know, you may think that that's unfair, you may agree with it, but the one thing I do know is that never in the history of this country have we had an FBI director who sat at the top of two investigations, one into the candidate mm -hmm. of a major party a political campaign, and another investigation, which would then run simultaneous to people associated with the other candidate for high office. And so, I, t I talk about Comey, I know him the person, I know he's a good person. I, you know, people say he's pious and sanctimonious. In this era where our leaders lie to us with reckless <laughs> abandon every single day, right, about big things and small things, maybe a little piety isn't so bad, uh, you know, <laughs> someone who actually cares about the truth. Um, but he'll have to defend his actions yeah. and explain them. Uh, so I, I want Josh to be able to talk about uh, uh, the, where, your support of the book and, and uh, something unique that he's doing before we close up for the evening. No, thanks for letting me do this. So I, uh, and I'll be brief, because uh, I, I appreciate your time and thanks for, thanks for being here. One thing that this book is doing, so I mentioned two purposes of this book, you know, giving voice to the voice, so it's the public safety aspect. The last angle, the, the last prong has nothing to do with the topic of the, the book. And I want to use this book as a vehicle for a cause that, that is important to me and hopefully will be important to you. In writing this book, one thing that I learned, and, and I kind of grappled with, and I actually, this book almost didn't make it because I almost, you know, shut it down because I didn't want to be seen as, well, this guy's leaving the FBI, he's going to cash in and write this memoir, and, you know, this tell-all, which it's, you know, it's, it's not a tell-all. Um, but I didn't want to be seen as that person. And in writing this book, I actually learned of this fund that the FBI Agents Association has established uh, that cares for the family members of fallen FBI agents. And it's important because, you know, obviously agents die in the line of duty, but what I learned in writing this book is that there are still FBI agents that are dying from illnesses mm. that are now manifesting today from 18 years ago when they were at ground zero digging through the rubble. 
And every year, the agents that were there, you're talking about hundreds of agents that were down processing the scene for weeks and months on end, every year they have to get tested. And one agent I talked to said that it's like walking in and figuring, trying to determine whether your death sentence is now gonna be read back to you because we've seen a number of these illnesses. And so this fund that takes care of the family of, of FBI, families of FBI agents has, has now been strapped recently because you have all these new kids that are on the roll mm. because they pay for their college, they send them. So half of my proceeds from this book are going to that fund. And I think the reason it's important to, to say is because this is, this is not controversial, right? Everything that we've talked about today, you may agree, sir, in the back, you know, with your great comments, so I appreciate. We may disagree on things that are controversial. This is not controversial, helping people that, that need it. So whether you like the book, whether you disagree with the book, whether you don't even buy the book, I want you to know about that fund uh, because again, as these agents continue to get tested and God forbid, you know, they continue to lose more, they're going to be in need. So I, I wanted to use this as a vehicle to spotlight that. We're grateful for you, uh, to you for doing that and for writing this book. Josh, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks so much. Uh, for all your work, um, Josh and I appear at every major disaster, crisis, and shooting in parallel panels, um, uh, but this is the first time we met, so for me it was a pleasure as no. well, and the book is absolutely terrific. So thank you all for coming out and supporting Harvard Books, and I'll let you take it.